And just before we take our seats, just want us to really appreciate Apostle Eddie. Um, you know, when he called me, I was happy and anxious at the same time because he, he has taught me quite a lot, in all honesty. We met about over 10 years ago, and he challenged me with quite a lot of things, um, one of which I remember the first financial policy that we drafted at church. He was the one who was coaching me to put it together. We are still using it to date. Taught me the basics. He taught me the basics of handling finances in the church. I mean, to the T, you know, how to put together a team that counts money, banking. Gave me samples of sleeps that we have to fill in. We are still using them to date. And one other thing that he taught me, because he's a very great husband and a father. And I remember one day he said to me, there was Disney on ice, the real one, not the, not the Pulukwane one. The real Disney on ice. <laughs> And we were talking over the phone and he was telling me how he's taking his kids and then just before we got off the call he said man if you are if you are not taking your kids to disney on ice you are worse than an unbeliever <laughs> and i remember i said man this he's challenging me and as from that year started taking my kids to disney on ice every year to a point that last year i actually took them to the real disney in Orlando. All because of you, Apostle. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything that you have taught me. Let's appreciate Apostle, please. Hallelujah. And Father, we just want to thank you tonight for your presence in this place. We just want to thank you for this great church, wonderful church. Thank you for this great vision, Lord, to equip men and also women, Lord, and so that we can be challenged the way that we are challenged, so that we can be inspired, so that we can rise up, oh God, and do something with what you are telling us to do. Father, we give you praise and we thank you that you will anoint my lips of clay tonight, that I will divinely speak your oracles in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give Jesus one more time a big hand of praise. Amen. And we, we can take our seats, you know. I really thank God um, for, for this opportunity. I'm so challenged as I'm sitting down there listening to various speakers and also the apostle challenging us the way that he does. And quite a couple of things come to mind. You know, a few weeks ago, I was saying something um, at church looking at how uh, Moses instructed, I mean, God instructed Moses to go and tell Pharaoh uh, to let the children of Israel go. And, you know, looking at that story, I could compare it with our situation today in our nation because the first thing that Pharaoh says to Moses, he says, okay, fine, you can go, but do not go far. You can still worship your God in my grounds. In other words, don't own any land, don't own any property. You can still clap hands here, and of which it's one of the lies that the devil is perpetuating to say as long as we can come in here, clap hands, sing a few choruses, uh, we must feel comfortable, and, and, but we are not owning any property, we are not buying land, we are not expanding, we are not growing, we are still doing everything in his own terms and in his own grounds. And the second thing that he then, after, of course, Moses comes and he says, no, you have to let us go. He says then to, to him, okay, go if you want to go, but leave your children here. Because Pharaoh was thinking of the next generation. He knew that if they go, probably many of them will never survive in the wilderness in any case. But if he gives him the next generation, if he keeps the next generation, he knows that as soon as they are wiped out, he will you know, do the same thing that he used to do with that generation with these ones here. Wow. And I'm happy with what the apostle is saying, talking about the next generation, the young people, because much as we can, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I'm glad 
with, with everything that people like Abu Apostle has imparted in my life. You know, I'm, 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 I'm 41 now, and I should be also at this stage thinking about those who are behind me so that the enemy will not wipe us out completely and repeat the same cycle that we tried to come out of. You know, so we need to be intentional. We need to be intentional. Our children, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, as black people, we still suffer from things such as uh, whenever we need to create opportunities for our children, we will say something like, you know how much I suffered for my education. Wow. I mean, if as long as we are still trapped in that mentality, there's nothing much we are going to do for the next generation. So we need to come out of that. Our children do not have to suffer the way that we did. They are living in a different time. You know, we, we can't say, I did not own an iPhone until I was 35. I mean, really, if, if they can get an iPhone now, give them the iPhone. If they, if they eat cheese, some of us, we're still trapped in a situation where we say, you know, I, I used to have lunch. It was only bread and butter. That's it. There was no cheese. I mean, that was in 1978 or something. But this is 2019, for goodness sake. Let that child have that cheese. If they want to have it twice a day, let them have it twice a day. It's a different time. It's a different season. So we need to break away from that mentality. But look at what then Moses does. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Pharaoh does. The third time Moses comes back, he says, fine, you can go. Take your children, but keep your kettles. Leave your kettles behind. Leave your livestock behind. And I like Moses' response. Because he says to him, Pharaoh, we are not going to leave our sacrifices yes. behind. Look, Pharaoh calls it kettles. But Moses calls it sacrifices. And then he says to him, because we do not even know how we are going to worship this God. Because his instruction is... Let my people go so that they may serve me, so that they may worship me. So Moses says, we don't even know what is going to be required for us to serve God effectively. So we can't leave our wealth behind. We have to take our wealth with. And, and it's not enough to speak in tongues, to prophesy, roll on the floor, clap hands, sing choruses. All that is nice, but it's not enough. Because that is not going to help us buy properties. That is not going to help us send out missionaries. That is not going to help us build buildings, build schools, build clinics, build hospitals. It's not going to, if we are going to worship God without wealth, we are going to be stranded for a very long time. Let me make this example, and I'm going to get into the message shortly. And I know it's a, it will not come out right, but it's fine. Thank you, Chairperson. <laughs> I know a few white pastors. I got who are less anointed, less graced, started ministry a couple of years ago, two or three. Some of them broke every ethic that you can think of when they started their churches. Ethics that we are told we are not supposed to violate and we have tried our level best not to violate them. We are praying. I mean, you can't compete with blacks in as far as prayer and fasting is concerned. We go to the mountains 40 days. We seek the face of God. We, we can cut up a sign that when we call a whole night prayer, I mean, I tell you, we pray and heavens are shaking. And I know a few white churches, just a few, where there was not even a single midweek prayer meeting, <laughs> let alone all night prayer or half night prayer. There's no intercession of some sort for hours, nothing. And yet they can start a church, build it, finish it before their first service. Children's church fully furnished everything to the T. Higher staff before even first service. And in their first service, the church is full to capacity. 2,000, 3,000 seater, 5,000 seater. Why? 
needs money. It's money. Just just recently, a church was built in Kailami in four ways. Exactly the way that I'm describing it. No a revival for two weeks before the launch of the church. Nothing. No casting out of devils. No miracle water. Nothing. Just social media. Yes, our, we are opening a church. Our doors are opening. Grand opening. Come all. First service. Packed to capacity. Now, that is not worrying me. The fact that it's packed. But here's what is worrying me. Packed with black people. <laughs> packed with black people. The very saying that when a pastor goes on a vacation with his own money, they make a big issue out of it. But when they get there, the pastor's vacation is part of the church's budget. Okay, let's get into the word. I see that it's... So if we don't get conferences like this, I'm telling you, we are going to sing choruses until Jesus comes. But we will never shake communities. We will never shake. We will sing choruses. We will pray in tongues. We will prophesy. We will be fighting with other people who are coming here to do other things. But there is nothing significant that we are going to do. Nothing. It takes us 20 years just to fight for one building. 20 years just to build one, the first building. Just to have a building dedication, 20 years. Nakona is a small and a facility. When the founder is about to die. Oh my goodness. So we are talking about unlimited kingdom wealth. Tell your neighbor and say, we gotta make money. We gotta make money. Gotta make money. I, I, I'm like I'm like apostle. I hate poverty with everything. Uh, I I I wrote a book shunning poverty. A lo, a, you know, a couple of years ago, I I because I was broke, I was frustrated, and I said, to, and I started asking questions, and God showed me that you are the one who chose the forgiveness of sins yeah. over other things that I've provided. You see, if you ask Christians about heaven, they have divine assurance that I'm going to heaven. But when you talk money, it's like, yeah, see a goose, a maras goose. Isn't it? And today I'm going to intentionally use or choose the subject developing a mindset for gradual wealth building. And I put that word gradual there for a purpose. Because it all begins in a mind. A Russian-American writer and philosopher, Ayn Rand, who was also an author, said something very powerful. She said, wealth is a product of man's capacity to think. Wealth is a product of man's capacity to think. If you can't engage your mind, wealth will be far away from you. And this is where many of us get it wrong and we think spiritual things are supposed to be void of intellect and reasoning. And yet the Bible speaks about the mind of the spirit. So meaning God himself thinks. And one of the other hip-hop artists known also in the U.S. said something similar along those lines. And he said, true wealth is not that of the pocket. But he said, it is that of the heart and of the mind. So it all begins in the mind. Unless one de develops a mindset and an attitude of creating wealth or building wealth. And here's the other thing. 
Too many people are too obsessed with having money. But only a few people are willing to create or to build wealth. And the people who are obsessed with having money will, will do whatever it takes to have it. They will kill. They will lie. They will steal. They will, che- they will do whatever it takes because their mindset and their attitude is, I want to have money and I want to have it now. And in most cases, they are only obsessed or thinking about their own survival so that I can have a car, live in a comfortable home, but they are not thinking generationally. They are not thinking, people who are obsessed about having money are not thinking generations. They are not thinking about their children. They are not building generationally. They are not doing what the scriptures say, that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and for his children's children. I mean, the Bible says so you can be a Christian and not be a good man. <laughs> you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not be a good, and as far as God is concerned, before we can say you are a good person, at least you must be able to leave some for your children and for your children's children. But people who are obsessed about having money only focus on, I want to have it now, I want to have it tomorrow, so that I can squander it, and they're not thinking generationally. They will not leave a legacy behind. They will not develop and equip their children. They, they, they are satisfied. You, this is where you see a person who, who drives a Range Rover, and yet they can't take their child to a best school to be given better edu- education. When, 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 when there are requirements or needs, Escolini, they complain, and yet they are installment. And, and it's even worse, installment, because sometimes we just afford an installment, not necessarily the car. And, and you, you see, we are trapped in the survival mode. Because I want to look posh. I want to look sharp. And yet I don't have a mindset to develop my own child. So that by the time he reaches my age, he will be a dangerous young boy or young man. We we are not thinking that by the time he gets married, at least. Because how do we compete how do you compete with a white man who when he finishes or he finishes metric, already he's driving a car? Already he's driving a car. He finishes metric, he goes to varsity. When we are toy toying for tuition, they are fight, fighting for parking space. <laughs> and yet we still have time to enjoy and have fun. And yet we are not looking back to say, what is it that I can do to give my children a head start? So that when he graduates and he, 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 he gets his first job, he will not be thinking car. Because he's already driving. It's not a, he's used to it. But it takes a certain mindset, it takes a certain attitude to say, I am going to do whatever it takes for the sake of the generation. No, no, no. But if you are obsessed about having money, you are only thinking about yourself. These are the people who do not mind to to park a car that is worth more than the house. I see them. But a person who thinks about building or creating wealth thinks generationally. This person says, I'm going to make it not just for me. And even in the context of being a pastor leading in a church, Everything that I am doing is not only so that I can be a great man of God who glows in the dark, but I need to look over my shoulder and see that there are others coming after me. What is it that I can do? I, I said, when I started ordaining pastors at church, I said to them, guys, I, I, mean, I started in a shack with four people. 
No sound system, nothing. But I don't wish that for any of you. It's unnecessary. In a black church, we call it, but it's unnecessary. <laughs> it's what Apostle was talking about. It's a sacrifice we are giving that was not required. God did not ask us in that context. Now, of course, there will be somebody who is going to be a pioneer in front of us. They might be going through some stuff. But we are not going to be buying or redeeming time if we are expecting those who are coming after us to go through exactly the same thing that we, that we have gone through. If we bought our first building at Telmas, Butlin Christian Center, we bought our first building 13 years after the church's, 13 or 12 years after the church's existence. Now, if I'm going to expect the same thing to happen, now we are not going to be redeeming time. So I said, uh, my wish is that by the time we plant branches and, and stuff like that, and we've started already, by the time we have our first service, there should be sound system, fully fledged. There should be chairs. There should be everything. Yes. Then we are being progressive. Amen. So, but, so we need to really think generationally, right? We, we really need to be intentional. Begin by building gradually. That's why I said, that's why I said that word gradual, I put it there for a reason. We need to be very gradual. Amen. But let's read a scripture and then we are going to go through a few principles and then I'm closing. I'm left with only 20 minutes. Amen. Nehemiah 2. <laughs> Nehemiah 2, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste. And its gates are bent with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do to this good work. Verse 19. But when San Balat... The Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab head of it. <laughs> they laughed at us and despised us. This is the intimidation Apostle was talking about. And said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. So in other words, what we are doing here has got nothing to do with you. But everything to do with us. Of course, we have challenges as black people, but we'll solve our own problems. Amen. What do you expect when you take a child, put him in a cage for 20 years, and then after 20 years, unlock the cage and say, here's a car, here's a house. Here's a wife. <laughs> what do you expect? What do you expect? It's going to be a disaster for the first couple of years. It's going, unless the child will be determined. And if you've got 20 of those, of course, 18 of them might not make it. But the two are supposed to be determined and say, I'm going to arise. And I'm going to learn. I'm going to catch up. For the past 20 years, I've been put in a cage. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to catch up. I'm going to learn. And I'm going to master this thing. I'm going to master this thing. But, but let's, let's go through a few principles. And then we are going to close in a moment. The Bible does not shy away from declaring the existence of the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of heaven. The Bible openly tells us that the, the kingdom of God is from everlasting to everlasting. It says... It rules over every other kingdom. So in other words, the kingdom of God himself recognizes and acknowledges the existence even of other kingdoms that are in opposition uh, uh, towards the kingdom of God. Are we here? 
The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, declared the same. He came preaching the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. He introduced the kingdom. The apostles did the same thing they taught. And you and I are supposed to do the same thing. We are supposed to bring the awareness that there is a kingdom called the kingdom of God or called the kingdom of heaven. There is such. And many of us, even though we are born again and we are Christians, the, the first body, of course, that we are going to be introduced to is the church. And that's the beginning. And of course, you cannot be active in the kingdom without being active in the church. Sometimes I hear people obsessing too much about the kingdom at the expense of the church. And we forget that Jesus uh, entrusted the administration of the affairs of the kingdom to the church. He said to Peter, I will give you, I will build my church upon this rock. And he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Yeah. So that whatsoever you in the church, you bind here on earth, it shall be bound. So we cannot, of course, you know, build or support the kingdom at the expense of the church. Everything, even kingdom citizens are equipped in the church. They are empowered in the church. They are trained in the church so that they can become relevant for the kingdom. Are we together? So then you and I, through our faith in Jesus Christ, through our new birth experience, then we become the citizens of the kingdom of God. Jesus says something very powerful uh, to Nicodemus in John chapter number 3, uh, verse 4. He says, Nicodemus, the Bible says, Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? When he is old, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus says in verse 5, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you can be in the church, but not be in the kingdom. And the only way you can access the kingdom is when you are born of the spirit, is when you are born again. Then you will become the citizen of the kingdom. And the biggest challenge that we have today is that we, we have churches that are full of people who are not yet part of the kingdom. And we are trying to instill kingdom principles into those people and yet they struggle because, because serving in the kingdom is another level of serving. Amen. It's different from if you are... If you are if you are acknowledging the existence of the kingdom of God, then you can't be just a lukewarm type of a Christian. You, you can't be challenged by just attending a church service. Because the requirement in the kingdom is much more higher than the requirements of, of a local church. So once we are born again, then Jesus says to Nicodemus again, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. You cannot perceive it. You cannot recognize it. You cannot, you cannot acknowledge it. You cannot see its existence. You cannot even realize that there is a kingdom because the kingdom, Jesus says, is, is not something that you can point and say it's over there. You cannot see it with your physical eye. It takes a regenerated spirit to even perceive that there is a kingdom. We can be talking about kingdom wealth here. And somebody might be wondering, what are you talking about? But, but it takes our eyes to be open, to begin to perceive that there is much more to us gathering together, clapping hands and singing songs. There is much more to us pitching tents and preaching the gospel. There is much more to us laying hands upon the sick and, and to, for us praying for blessing. There is much more. There is a kingdom that God is busy establishing. There is a kingdom that God is busy building for a specific purpose. Now, the kingdom of God has got a various characteristics. I'm, I'm watching my time. And Jesus taught on these extensively in the Gospels. Number one, he says, in Matthew 13, verse 40, 44, he shows us that the kingdom is actually concealed, but yet it is a good kingdom and worth sacrificing for. In that parable, as a matter of fact, he shows how you, 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 you can sell everything that you have for the sake of the kingdom. It's worth sacrificing for. It's worth suffering for it. Do whatever it takes to secure it for yourself. And of course, number two, uh, it shows us in Matthew 13 from verse 31 that the kingdom of God will be seen through growth. Increase and fruitfulness and, of course, multiplication. Because anything that is not growing, it is busy dying. So you, you cannot be part of the kingdom of God and not experience growth. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of God itself is gradually growing. 
We might be acknowledging it, we might be seeing it or not, but, but the kingdom of God is gradually growing. It is expanding all over. And I am beginning to realize, Apostle, that all over in different cities, there are more, there are more leaders that are rising up. There are more kingdom conscious. And they are beginning to be convicted to see the bigger picture of what, what, what is it that we are actually doing when we are preaching. So you will see growth increase, fruitfulness. So even when the kingdom of God is affecting you as a person, there has got to be some growth in your life. There has got to be some form of fruitfulness in your life. There has got to be some form of multiplication in your life. Number three, Jesus then in Matthew 13 verse 45, and, and all of these scriptures are there. And of course in Matthew 13 verse 45 and verse 46, he shows how the kingdom of God is pure and valuable. He compares it to a pearl, a precious pearl. That's why he says, sell everything that you have. Just so that you can, you can secure it. Because it is pure and it is valuable. Number four, the kingdom of God is attractive and accommodative. I mean, the kingdom of God is one kingdom that I know that will attract anyone and, 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 and everyone from all walks of life. The kingdom of God is able to draw a beggar from the streets. And it is able to draw a multimillionaire that sits in the high offices in Sentin City or even in New York. That's the nature and the character of the kingdom of God. Jesus says it is like a dragnet. It, it, it pulls people from all walks of life. It pulls people young and old, different shapes and sizes because God has a divine plan and a purpose. That's why he does not choose only the, 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 the select of the elect, but he takes everybody. As long as you believe, as long as you are willing, God says there's a room, there's a place for you in the kingdom. There, there is room for you to grow. There's room for you to be capacitated so that you can do something great with your life. Number five, the kingdom of God is resourceful. It is a very resourceful kingdom. It's just that sometimes we underestimate the power of the kingdom of God. And sometimes if we can just learn to master joining our resources together, we can realize how resourceful we are. I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming of a time, Apostle, where one local church can be able to buy a church building for another local church. I'm dreaming of a time where another pastor will be able to buy a car for another pastor. Because while one is suffering, there's somebody else somewhere who can afford five of the things that you are in need of praying for day and night. We are a very resourceful kingdom. I mean, the amount of information that we have had here tonight, some people pay thousands and thousands of dollars just to listen to, to, to five minutes of what was said here, fraction of what was said here. Sometimes we host speakers from far, <laughs> and they come and say less than what we have had here tonight. And yet people, like I can invite Apostle Eddie, and I can say registration is 50 rands. And only 10 people can show up. But sometimes we call names that will repeat the same sermon that they preached last year when they came. And registration is $1,000 and people will be, able to, will be willing to pay. Number six, the kingdom of God is an economic entity. Matthew 18 from verse 23, read that at home. Number seven, the kingdom of God it promotes diligence. We have to work. We have to put in some work. We have to be serious with what we are doing. Number eight, the kingdom of God has a supportive king. Matthew 22 and verse 2. He will not give you an assignment and not give you the anointing and the grace to do it. He will not give you an assignment and not give you the wisdom to do it. He will not give you an assignment and not connect you with the right people who are going to help you to accomplish that assignment. Number nine, the kingdom of God promotes accountability. Matthew 25 from verse 14 through to 19. And lastly, the kingdom of God has power to influence. And I want to focus mainly on that tonight. Because Jesus in Matthew 13 verse 33, he says, another parable he spoke to them. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like living, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. So in other words, that's the, that's the nature and the character of the kingdom of God. You can, you can plant one church somewhere, started by one person. Like when we started our church in Delmas, there was only four of us when we started. There was only four of us. A seed of the kingdom that was sown in Delmas. But, but what did it do? It began to grow. 
it is like a leaven. Then it begins to influence people around. It, it, it begins to draw many around. And today we, we, are, we have grown over 500 and we have a campus in, in Delmas and we are starting another campus in Ilof next year. Because that's the nature and the character of the kingdom of God. It has the power to influence. But realize that the kingdom of God, Jesus says, it is within you. So the first thing that the kingdom of God needs to do is to influence you. You see, once you are in the kingdom and the kingdom is in you, but you remain the same person. You are not transforming. You are not changing. As a matter of fact, you are becoming more religious because many of us, we think, we come to church, we are saved just so that we can come and become religious zombies. And that's not, that's not God's intention. And many of us, we come to church, we are saved, and we are patiently waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that is not the mentality and the mindset of God. God took us from, our, from the different kingdom, brought us into his own kingdom so that he can influence us so that he can influence the way that we think so that he can shift our thinking patterns our belief systems so that he can renew our minds so that we can begin to believe differently because all of us before we became christians we had our own philosophies of life principles that we followed unconsciously sometimes and we just simply believe because umalu me said you see? And then we adopt it as a philosophy of life. You see? Uh, 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 many other things like the myths Apostle was talking about concerning money. That, that, that you know, uh, sometimes, you know, God teaches me a lesson just by being poor and broke. Such philosophies that we adopt. But God says, once you are in my kingdom, I put the kingdom in you. But this kingdom is not supposed to lie dormant on the inside of you. This kingdom needs to begin to manifest. It needs to grow in you. It needs to produce fruit in you. It needs to begin to influence the way that you do things now. It needs to give you a fresh and a different perspective. And all of that happens right in the house of God. The more we hear the word of God, the more our minds are renewed. Listen. We don't just listen to the word of God for the sake of listening to the word of God. We listen to the word of God so that our minds may be renewed. So that we can be challenged. So that we can be transformed in the way that we are living our lives. There is absolutely no way that the kingdom of God can dwell on the inside of you and not affect you if you allow it to do so. There is absolutely no way. But the more you are open, because that's why Jesus said this powerful thing. He said, if you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, it says, the word of God is powerful, right? Sharper than any two edges, so it is alive. But yet, Jesus mentions that there is something much more powerful than the word, which is our previous or our former belief systems, our tradition. It says it renders the word ineffective. The word of God, much as it is powerful, much as it is alive, much as it is sharper than any two, two edges, sword, but it can sit on the inside of you and do nothing. Because you choose to believe in something else that Ukoko said, or Umkulu said, or my friend at school said, or what my teacher said. And we choose to believe in those things. And yet the word that has got the capacity to activate the wealth that is available in the kingdom of God is just sitting lying dormant in there. Remember, I said earlier that the kingdom of God is good, the kingdom of God is valuable, the kingdom of God is resourceful. So each and every one of us here, we are sitting and walking around with a seed that is good, a seed that is valuable, a seed that is resourceful, waiting to be stirred up, waiting to be activated, waiting to be released, waiting to be, to be expanded so that it can release everything that is locked within it. You see, inside a seed, they are, they, there's a stem, there are branches, there are leaves, there are fruits inside a seed. Inside a seed, but it's up to you. You can, you can put that seed in a cup, it will not do anything. But as soon as you take that seed, you put it in the ground, you water it gradually. Take note, you water it, you nurture it. It's not about being obsessed about having a fruit tomorrow, but it is a guarantee that I have a seed that has been sown in the ground and I am working on it each time I come to church, each time I am praying, each time I am giving, each time I am reading the scriptures, each time I am reading a book, each time I am taking action, there is a seed that is being nurtured underground. And sooner or later, the ground will crack open. Sooner or later, 
<laughs> I, I might be maybe walking around for the past 10 years and nothing was showing in my life that something great is going to come, you know, from my life. But let me tell you, as long as I am sure that there is a seed of greatness that has been sown on the inside of me. Amen. Now let me close. The kingdom of God has the power and the capacity to influence us with its glorious power. Psalm 145 and verse 10, the Bible says, All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of the kingdom. This is the glory that is available in the kingdom of God for each and every one of us. And the Bible tells us how the more we behold this glory, the more we are changed, the more we are transformed. It's time when we come and we see how God is able to display his wisdom. He's able to display his power. Well, as soon as Barcelona, we can be transformed in a, in, a, in a manner that when we come to church, you know, we don't just come to be spectators, but we can see and look at how everything is being done and allow ourselves to be inspired instead of criticizing go back home change your home transform impart the spirit of excellence at home this is how the kingdom influences you but what do we do sometimes we come to why did we have to buy so expensive church? no 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 this environment is preparing you so that by the time you start your own business you will function under the influence of the kingdom operating under the spirit of excellence that you have received in the house of God. That's why we start shady businesses because we have never seen excellence nowhere. So that's why when we start churches and we be, begin to operate at a certain level, don't be upset that you know, these ushers are telling me where to sit. Eh, this is the, eh, and sometimes they become too strict. And this is too much. No, no, no. It's instilling something in you that you will not get anywhere else. Many of us, we come in here. We cannot afford to go to Harvard. We cannot afford to go to universities. But boy, I am telling you, some of the principles that are coming from this platform, these are the principles that many are paying millions to access and that's how the kingdom is supposed to influence us the kingdom of God is supposed to influence us up to a point where you are going to be irritated by any sign of poverty in your life uh, it needs to influence you up to a certain point that when you go back home you are going to realize this is not the way that I am supposed to live this is not the God the God that I saw at gateway and when I was worshiping it seems as if this God is not here at home this kingdom is supposed to influence you up to a point just like Abu Nehemiah where they said look at the distress that we are in I, I, I don't like what I see around me I don't like the way that my children are suffering I don't like the way that I have to beg all the time for me to make the ends meet but I need to rise up and I need to begin to build one stone at a time one brick at a time I'm willing to sweat I am willing to cry but baby I am busy building something here um, it might not be looking like it but I am laying one brick at a time time. I am attending that one meeting. I am knocking on that one door. I am meeting that one person. Sooner or later, this thing, baby, is going to be stirred up on the inside of me. Wealth is going to come forth. Why? Because I have told myself, I am not going to sit down and complain and moan, but I am going to tell myself, I am going to rise up and I am going to build this thing. I'm going to build my life come hell or high waters. I'm going to build my life. Whether or not I have a bursary baby I would rather walk into that library get a book sit down and read through those pages equip yourself I am going to rise up and build my family I refuse to have just a lukewarm type of a family structure I'm going to be a loving husband I'm going to equip my wife I'm going to equip my children I'm going to create a healthy environment for my family to thrive why I am busy building we cannot sit down anymore, church. We cannot be talking about the testimonies of other people, but we need to tell each other. We need to just look at each other on the face and say, you know what, baby, if you don't rise up, I'm, go I'm deciding, Mina, Mina, I'm deciding. I'm rising up. I'm going to build something in my life. I'm going to build a career. I'm going to build a business. I'm going to make sure that by the time I leave this planet, I'm going to leave a legacy behind. And don't listen to those who are telling you that your dreams are too big. 
that your idea is too big. Don't listen to the one who is ridiculing you, who is laughing at you, telling you that you always talk about big things. You are, you are thinking highly of yourself. Don't listen to that son Bala. Don't listen to that one who is telling you that you don't have what it takes. You are less educated. You've never been rich before. Where are you going to get the funding? Don't listen to them. Just tell them this one thing, just like Nehemiah, my God will prosper me. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? I want us to walk out of this place declaring my life is going to change. My family is going to change. My business is going to change. My career is going to change. I am going to just be patient with myself. Gradually I will build this wealth. One rand at a time. One hundred at a time. One thousand at a time. I'm going to lay it brick by brick. It might take me years but I am building it. Rather than to wait for luck that is going to hit one day. Rise up and build something. Work on something. Let there be a project in your hand. Work on something. Let there be something that you are working on. God bless you. Atmosphere shift now. Broken. Hey now, Holy Spirit, come. Father, we just want to thank you tonight for a great word that has been shared in this place. We thank you, Father, that we are rising up to build. Lord, we thank you that we are here as a people that we are going out there.